On energy solutions, we're always talking about the best way to get three things, reliable, affordable, and cleaner energy. And we're not the only ones trying to achieve those goals, but the devil and the disagreement lies in the details. So today we're talking with someone who doesn't agree with us on all of the details, but offers a lot of food for thought on how to build the grid of the future. In many parts of the country, regional transmission organizations and independent system operators, also known as RTOs and ISOs, govern the flow of electricity. Compared to a system where one utility has a monopoly over the generation and delivery of power in a state or smaller region, RTOs and ISOs have brought tremendous benefits to consumers, energy reliability, and even the environment. That's because they allow power to be competitively bought, sold, and shared over a wide region, creating efficiencies and greater savings both on cost and carbon emissions. They also improve reliability because power reserves in other states can be brought online when one area has more demand. EPSA, along with renewable energy buyers, competitive renewable developers, and other experts say RTOs and ISOs are the essential foundation to get where we want to go on climate, cost, and energy security. Over the summer, nine former members of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission wrote a letter to the current FERC saying just that. But Vince Duane, who spent almost 17 years in senior leadership at the nation's largest RTO, PJM Interconnection, disagrees. He published a paper with former FERC Commissioner Tony Clark saying RTOs might not be the best path forward, but as you'll hear, he's still a supporter of markets, and he still thinks competition and the RTO model have brought a lot of benefits. So I sat down with Vince to hear more about what he thinks the challenges are with RTOs and whether there might be ways to deliver on the promise they began with and to continue the progress that they have enabled. Here's Vince. This is a subject, as I mentioned, that... um... You know, near and dear to my heart. So thanks for having me. Great. We're glad that you could be here with us. So let, let's do a little background first. So let's talk briefly about your prior role at PJM. Your, your laundry list of responsibilities was significant. You were there for longer, I think, than maybe you originally thought you would be. So you, you saw a significant trans, transformation, I guess is the right word, over that 17 years. Talk a little bit about the positive advancements that you saw over that period of time. Yeah, I mean, I think what we were able to demonstrate um, was that uh, there is a tremendous amount of headroom for regional coordination. And there's a lot to be said for reducing the balkanization of balancing authorities and the efficiencies that come from uh, a broad uh, central commitment of resources across a large geographic footprint, Mm -hmm. Um, the efficiencies in the wholesale market um, were, I think, fairly evident. Um, The emissions reductions were tremendous and the ability to maintain a liability while at the same time turning over a very significant portion of the generation fleet um, in a fairly rapid time for this industry um, I think are all success stories, and um, you know, PJM certainly, in my opinion, deserves uh, credit for that, and that's PJM and its community. Sure. You recently put out a paper that talked a little bit about what some of the challenges, as you see them, are about markets and RTOs or RTO governance and participants. And so I'm curious, what gave you pause or what's caused you to change your thinking a bit and, and kind of what are some of the foundational problems as you see them? Okay, uh, Todd, that's a big question. Um, you know, it's a combination of factors, but uh, a big reason I, I decided to leave PJM is I had um, raised a couple of these sort of broader policy concerns um, within the organization and, um, and put out sort of my feelings as to, you know, what the organization needed to do to confront mm-hmm the very significant changes that were going on around it. Um, But to sort of explain, you know, so what are those sort of broader areas of um, sort of inflection, um, I'd lump them into two areas. One is is the design of the markets and whether it, um, the market design continues to be relevant to the objectives Mm -hmm. that, um, that society, that uh, that the consumer, the policymaker, the lawmaker, what they what they're looking for, does it continue to deliver on, on, on those expectations? And secondly, if not, um, is the organization 
structured in a way where we can reasonably expect that it will be able to make the changes necessary, make the transformations necessary um, in its operations, in its markets, in its planning, in order to, to adapt. And I have some fairly serious concerns about the governance and the institutional strength of these RTOs. And there's a lot that's going on right now that's uh, uh, you know, only reinforcing that mm-hmm. in my mind. So um, you know, I, I've, I've enjoyed the last couple of years and the opportunity to speak to people, the opportunity to publish some things, just to try to get these issues out on the table. Um, and you know, a lot of the feedback I get is, well, I don't really disagree with what you're saying, Vince. I just don't like it. And I respond typically by saying, well, I don't like my message that much either. I wish it were different. But if we're serious about um, uh, figuring out what the next 20 years looks like for these organizations, I think it behooves all of us to get all that stuff on the table, put a light on it, and have an honest discussion about it. And frankly, that's why we wanted to have you join us, because we share that desire for the honest conversation. I'm curious if you think that it's, is it a function of the rash of state subsidies, or is it the the penetration of renewables? Is it the continued desire to put resources in certain state portfolios, regardless of cost, that's driving much of the thought that you put into this? Well, I think... You know, what we're facing, Todd, is, is, is a situation where policymakers, particularly, you know, obviously for uh, climate being sure. first and foremost, but the environmental objectives um, and other local objectives um, are increasingly being sort of put to the ISO and with the expectation that, that the ISO will address that mm-hmm. alongside um, regional markets right. and the efficiencies and economic value that historically they have brought alongside with the reliability proposition as well. And my quarrel really is, I wish there was a more enlightened way of pursuing these objectives and a recognition that, um, you know, we're not going to get, uh, you know, there's some trade-offs that need to be made across sure. those three interests. Um, and it's a dynamic situation. Things will change and improve over time. Efficiencies will mm-hmm. develop. Technologies will develop. Uh, and, you know, those trade-offs may become uh, less dramatic and potentially, you know, we will disappear at some point and we'll be able to have everything we want to have out of our electric system, a reliable system, a clean system, and one that is cost-effective to mm-hmm. the consumer. Um, but the path we're taking in many respects uh, is, it seems, designed to avoid having that discussion of trade-offs. And it puts the ISO in particular in a position of where well, you figure out, you make it work. And look, on one hand, uh, the ISOs have done a great job historically of meeting those types of sure. challenges. Um, and doing what couldn't be done or what what people said couldn't be done Um, and delivering reliability and efficiency over an ever-expanding footprint. Um, But these other interests are, are, um, I think, extremely difficult to digest uh, with the organizational and and the structural paradigms that are sort of foundational Mm -hmm. to the ISO. So... um, you know, what do we do? We want something has to change. Mm-hmm. Ideally, I would like to see things that markets do a better job of digesting, like carbon prices, um, to address. Glad you went there. We were we were going to ask you in a bit, but feel <laughs> free to, to dive in. We're happy well, to chat about I, that. You know, I think it's it's no great secret that uh, most people, at least you know, from the from the textbook perspective, say, "Well, this is the way to do this," mm-hmm. um, and a lot of public. Uh, goods are addressed that way and they work their way through the organized electricity markets. Uh, If people have health and safety standards, those impose costs, those costs get reflected in Mm -hmm. offers, those offers get reflected in the price, the market works that way. So regulation and markets can work together very effectively. And often do. And have to in this industry, absolutely. Um, But once you start sort of uh, this 
more command and control approach of, I want to put these sort of resources in place. I want them in there tomorrow. I want them in my state. Mm -hmm. I want them to create these jobs. I want them to support the, you know, port activities in, in the port of sure. XYZ state, yep. wherever. Um, a lot of these things get very much more in the nature of challenges and disruptions mm -hmm. to the market than things that can be digested through the market. So the question I have is that I've had to ask myself is, well, are we going to be able to change that approach? And I think there's a lot of smart um, and, and certainly much more credible persons than I am pushing those types of sort of rethinking how mm -hmm. we're going to bring environmental benefit to the system. Um, I am taking it from the standard of, well, what if that doesn't change? What do the RTOs and what do the organized sure. markets have to do to accept that world as it seems to be unfolding? Right. And I know there's been work done even on, on behalf of PEPSA to talk about carbon price and what the implications are and the separation of a societal benefit, which is a reduction to carbon emissions that is not directly linked to the operational requirements of a system. So you, your system needs to operate X megawatts equals Y load because those have to be in perfect balance. And if you want to address a carbon question, the way to do it is outside of operational requirements, but that's where, we, as we've talked about, the carbon price would address many of those. And, and I agree, virtually every credible economist says, this is the most efficient way to get there. And I think Professor Hogan says it well, that sometimes the intersection of what the textbook says and what the realities of the world are create some tension. And here we are, the, the political will to address the carbon question appears to be lacking. I'll say it that way. Yeah, and I, I mean, to, to argue the other side of the issue, I think there's a sense that the climate situation is a crisis, it's an imperative, and uh, there is a, I think, a, a reluctance and a caution, a wariness maybe is mm -hmm. the word, about, well, can we really expect the market, even if we do and advocate and advance smart policies mm -hmm. like carbon pricing, will we see the outcomes that we uh, desperately need to see? Um, and I think some people have answered that question sort of implicitly is that, no, we need to intervene. There needs to be uh, sort of a, an aggressive uh, governmental approach in order to see this happen in the time frame that we need to see happen. Um, so if you subscribe to that thinking, then, um, you know, and this was really the purpose of, of my paper with Tony Clark mm -hmm. in July was, well, what do the RTOs what, what does that mean for the, the uh, historic operations of the foundational underpinnings, the design objectives, mm -hmm. those kinds of things? And you know, what, what would have to happen in order for there to be a, you know, some kind of relatively peaceful coexistence between right. these government interventions with the operational sort of approach to markets uh, that the ISOs pursue. And I think you'd know better than I, given your history at PJM, at least, not necessarily all the markets, but there was a time when states were very happy to delegate that responsibility to PJM because power prices were coming down and the market provided them tremendous benefits. And when natural gas turned into the great benefit that we realized with the fracking revolution and prices fell through the floor, states were thrilled. Consumers benefited. It was a great trade-off. Everyone was comfortable with the bargain that they had made. And now there seems to be a shift in the bargain that yeah. people have made. And there's a different perspective that, yeah, I appreciate all the benefits that you provided me, but now I want what I want when I want it. Yeah, I think, you know, even, even single state ISOs, while they, they are able, I think, to work off a clearer mandate, there's no question, there's still a lot of chefs in the kitchen. To be sure. You know, you, anyone with experience in California will tell you <laughs> that there's right. many policymakers yeah. uh, out there. And uh, I think Texas is seeing a little bit of that as uh, it sorts itself out after February. So, but you're, you're absolutely correct. I think, you know, the, the trade-off here is regionalism is essential to optimizing the, the grid as we have it right. and the grid that we're going to have, yeah. and I think even more so. Uh, and regionalism 
by definition means there has to be um, sort of a loosening of the of the reins by state policymakers, um, and we're seeing a trend exactly in the, the yeah, opposite direction. direction. Yeah. So we're threatening the value that that comes from regionalism, and sort of the question is: Are there other ways outside of uh, sort of the RTO structure to to get to that? And but there's no free lunch, right? So right. that those, it's not as though the technologies that we have today are, on average, across the board, every hour of the year, cheaper than the technologies, the thermal technologies right. that we currently have. And that you know, you, you say that all oh, your your you, you don't support um, climate change or you you don't uh, support decarbonization of the grid. Well, that's not the case. But there's certain facts that we just have to accept. And what we have done is suppress wholesale prices and then load up retail prices right. at that end of the bill so that at the end of the day, the consumer is either paying more or isn't seeing the benefit and the efficiency benefit that are coming from some of these wholesale electricity markets. And that, that again, tragedy is too strong a word, but we should at least see that and recognize that in order to diagnose just you know, where do we go next? Yeah, you have to acknowledge the facts as they are if you're going to try to have an honest conversation going forward. And and so there's there's a disconnect sometimes between the rhetoric and the reality. And I think that's where you and I are trying to get to is, hey, look, the, the reality is right here in the middle. And if we want to address that and answer both of those parts of the equation, we've got to be honest about where the, the facts are. Yeah, I mean, and well, I, I agree with you, Todd. And I think we're kind of, um, you know, we're working in what's known as a post-truth world these days, right? So it's, we're not alone. And, uh, you know, increasingly, I think the climate situation is evolving from a what we want to, what we need, and, and that's accelerating. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, we're not... Uh, if anything, the need to keep the lights on is just as strong, if, if not more so. Couldn't agree more with that. And, uh, you know, there's national security implications for yep. that, as well as economic and health and safety implications. So the stakes are even higher on that side of the equation, too. So we have to, I mean, I keep saying the word trade-off. It's, it's, it's a four-letter word in this day and age. We have expectations. Yeah. We want, and we're used to getting what we want done and delivered immediately. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's tricky. And there's real practical limitations. I mean, as you know, I mean, we turned a pretty significant amount of the generation fleet over in a, I don't know if it's a record, but it was a very rapid amount of time. That's no easy task. And now to do that again with a whole different set of technologies can create a whole different set of issues. And so I wonder, as you look at that and you look at what's happening in the UK and in Europe and what we saw in California and in Texas, are there lessons to be learned or are there cautions that you say, this is exactly what I was trying to raise in the paper that I wrote or in my thinking? Well, I think, you know, there's operational uh, realities mm -hmm. and I'm not an expert enough to really speak to those beyond what we all see. Sure. We, we know we need... Uh, reliable, dispatchable resources still to keep the lights on. Right. So we can leave it at that. What I um, find, you know, more interesting is, okay, with that objective, we have embarked for over 20 years now uh, on a program in many parts of the country to deliver that mm -hmm. degree of reliability and dependability through the use of markets. The most important element of the market is the price. Mm -hmm. The price has to be right because the price is what conveys all the information we need mm -hmm. to consume, to not consume, to invest, uh, which unit is most efficient to dispatch. Yeah. The whole, everything comes from price. Yeah. So if there was one fundamental message that we were trying to express uh, in that paper was I think we have forgotten just how important it is. And if you don't have that price correct, because you are sort of whittling away at it, you're, 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 you're one indignity after another, mm -hmm. and you're just pressing it and suppressing it, mm -hmm. at a certain point, you can no longer expect it to deliver that first set of objectives right. that we discussed there. So I think where we're left now, post-Texas, California, um, what's going on in, in various places uh, across the world in, in Europe, um, is if we're not going to allow the market to 
deliver that. What kind of a structure do we have? And is there a hybrid available that allows us to retain some of the efficiencies um, that can come from um, the, 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 a market-based mm-hmm. approach and, and, and a degree of competition while at the same time accepting the fact that we're going to continue to intervene to pursue other policy objectives because we've chosen to pursue very valid policy mm-hmm. objectives, but we've chosen to pursue them in a particular way, and that seems intractable. Mm-hmm. We're going to continue to do that. So where do you know where do we go? And the, the standpoint you know, I come from is starting point rather mm-hmm. is it's a trade-off. And you cannot expect you know, prices will be the same right. and you can't expect efficiencies to be the same. And you certainly can't expect um, investors uh, to, to take on the risk of an investment um, when, you know, the market that they are relying on is no longer sort of robust enough to support that investment. So we're going to have to get and we're already seeing it, Todd. We're getting consumers back in the business of underwriting mm-hmm. technologies that um, you know are hopeful but unproven, uh, and other sort of you know changes to the grid. And I think we just need to recognize that mm-hmm. and understand that and understand the trade-offs of that. Yeah, it feels like it, we're no longer solving for least cost. We're solving for what some other cost plus is, depending on various policy goals. And the That's challenge, right. of course, in a large footprint is you have some states that have very different policy goals from other states and there's access to resources in some parts of in PGM in particular. There's a lot of natural gas in Pennsylvania and Ohio. There's wind on the shore of the Atlantic and those two are not necessarily closely aligned and the state policies come into tension. And that's, I think, what you've been talking about is how do you reconcile those various interests? How do you try to combine that into a market that allows them to effectively capture the value of that geographic diversity and diversity of supply and all those things and still come out with a ta-da moment and there's a price that consumers can afford to pay that ensures reliability. Right. I mean, that that seems to be the crux of it. That's it. And, you know, you're hitting on another challenge there, and that is sort of the governance. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, how do you run an ISO um, when so much authority has migrated away from sort of, in my opinion, the executive branch of the ISO, let's mm-hmm. call it the board and management, right. and has been dispersed across the stakeholder community. You've had the federal government essentially seed the playing field when it comes to policy setting. Uh, now, you know, let's see what the future holds, but sure. at this point, policy that the ISOs must respond to is coming out of the state houses, mm-hmm. not out of Capitol Hill, not out of the FERC, but out of the Public Utility Regulatory Commissions and state energy offices. Uh, when that's the case, you know, we, in the absence of kind of a regional compacts or regional authorities right. that are sort of you, you see in the public realm, how does the ISO, which you know historically has been described as a creature of FERC, How does it adapt to that Mm -hmm. situation? And in PJM, I think probably the most acute example Mm -hmm. where you've got 14 jurisdictions, which as you point out, with different objectives. But if policy is going to come to the ISO at that level, then I think, you know, unfortunately, the ISO has to reconfigure itself Mm -hmm. to, to sort of, individual like-minded states, and there will be some trade-off. Some, I think, can be preserved, but there will be some trade-off on the regional benefits mm-hmm. that we've discussed. I'm glad to hear you mention you know, the continued thought about how the RTO has to evolve. I mean, you saw the letter that nine FERC commissioners signed, this, I think it was this summer, talking about the benefits of RTOs. They ought to continue, perhaps expand would be in good order. But you've noted RTOs are under stress. There's yeah. significant issues. You come from inside an RTO. You have a lot of experience in line of sight that others who have not had your roles would know. And you've identified some real concerns. But if the RTOs are either hobbled or disassembled or what have you, how do you maintain the benefits of competition? I mean, of course, you would not be surprised. EPSA thinks that markets deliver value to consumers. It's good for our members, but what's good for our members has been good for consumers. It's actually been good for the environment. It's resulted in reduced emissions. We've got a lot of things that make a lot of sense. 
how do you reconcile or is this conversation part of trying to reconcile where we are versus where we may need to go to try and maintain those significant benefits is there something that we can boil it down to to kind of help get the conversation off on the right foot? Well, I think getting it off on the right foot, and that, it was the sincere hope of the paper uh, that, that Tony and I put together. Uh, and we have another one coming up that's intended in the same. Uh, we'll be same very time. interested to read it. Uh, thank you, Todd. Um, but it starts by recognizing the House needs to be gotten in order. I, I appreciate the perspectives of the nine commissioners that you, mm -hmm. you referenced. But as you point out, those of us that are working in the ISOs see there's some pretty fundamental problems that until those are resolved, um, sort of as we concluded, putting all your eggs in this ISO basket in order to advance a decarbonization agenda and do so in a way that maintains reliability and efficiency, I, I think that's a risky proposition. I, I'd rather we, again, get our house in order, clean it up, and then move forward with a model that, uh, that we know will be able to address those objectives. How do I reconcile that? Well, how, what are these people really saying? And I think there's a tendency uh, to conflate a couple of issues, mm -hmm. that, that people want competition in electricity markets. I like competition. Mm -hmm. You like competition. It's brought tremendous efficiencies. Competition gets conflated with ISOs, RTOs. Mm -hmm. Regionalism and regional uh, efficiencies, the types of things that are kind of, again, basic to starting with power pooling, right. but then evolving through to ISO, RTOs. Those get conflated with ISO, RTOs. So if we want to get regional efficiencies and benefit and we, uh, you know, we want competition, well, then the only way forward is to pursue it as an ISO RTO. And I'm going to sound a little bit like a dinosaur when I say this, but I don't think the answer is, let's go back to the traditional regulated model. We couldn't agree more. Yeah. I, but I do think we should dust off some of the ideas that were being discussed 20 years ago. Uh, and I have gone back and looked at some of these, and I, uh, the prescience of it, I mean, I find remarkable hmm. uh, 20 years later, around grid codes, trans codes, and uh, looking at a structure that still has a regional coordination element to it, but sits much more comfortably with the world of a public utility under the Federal Power Act, where we know who the owner is, mm -hmm. who the shareholders are. What we have in the ISO world, Todd, is a situation that's fairly unusual, where customers are controlling the enterprise. And I mean, you know, there's a lot of problems across corporate America. So anything I say here, somebody will say, well, you sure. know, they've got an issue. But, you know, we don't have the customers of Amazon electing the board of mm -hmm. directors of Amazon. Shareholders, customers are tend to be different in most examples. What the ISOs have adopted, at least those that are more corporate mm -hmm. in character, is a, a cooperative style of governance, um, like the electric cooperatives, like the agricultural sure. cooperatives, that will work. And that did work when there was a relatively small number of members with a very homogenous set of interests and objectives, and the ISO okay. was responsible for it. When least cost dispatch was everybody's goal, that model works. Precisely. And that has only, I think, you know, it, it, it was always a struggle, but I'll tell you a story. Just <laughs> my first meeting at PJM was a members committee meeting, and um, I had just walked into the organization, didn't really know what I was getting into. And a contentious issue, I wish for the life of me I could remember what it was, but I was, I was so new, I probably didn't understand it, mm -hmm. but I knew it was contentious. And it passed after a number of member representatives who at the time, by the way, were tended to be more senior mm -hmm. officers of their companies, they would grab the microphone and say, well, look, this particular initiative that we're approving today isn't in my organization's immediate best interests, at least not as I see it, but mm -hmm. it is in the best interests of the system that we're building here. And we know this is the direction the industry is taking. We know we will adapt to it. And that wasn't just said by one or two people. Sure. 
quite a few people. So there, there was a very different perception of winners and losers sure. in the environment back then of the stakeholder environment. And at the end of that process, the vote was announced and people stood up and congratulated each other and there was cheering and clapping. And I thought, what a fascinating illustration of kind of a cooperative governance yeah. here um, where people had a higher purpose in mind and were able to kind of strike the balance between their parochial yeah. corporate interests and what and the greater to be good. done and the greater good. Yeah. And um, I don't hear many of those stories today. No, that's gone. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's a naive, uh, but that's, I, I asked myself, would we today, all other things being equal, assuming it was the right thing to do still, and I think you know, there's questions again uh, about what we're looking for out of the grid that mm -hmm. change that, but let's put those aside for a second. If we were trying to do what was done in 1996, 97, and institute a security constrained bid based market mm -hmm. based on locational marginal pricing. And we had to take that through a stakeholder process today, today yeah. with a FERC that we have today, with the states um, in the places they're in today. I don't think we would get that done. Mm -hmm. So when you ask the question, well, you know, these people want to see ISO and RTOs advance. I think they're looking in the rearview mirror and saying, well, they were a great structure at the right place at the right time to do what needed to be done 20 years ago. And over the past you know, two decades has been, I think, unquestioned success and value. But we are really at a different point in time. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I look at that governance example and I go, if we're talking about radical changes so that we value the flexibility of resources, we value the dependability of resources, we figure out you know, some of the smart ideas that are being done to address mm -hmm. the fact that energy market prices are being driven lower, either through subsidies or through just the, the technology character of the resources. That's right. Yeah, the, the zero marginal cost resources. How do we really expect these chaotic ISO governance mechanisms to bring that kind of change organically? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people go, well, I don't know how that's going to happen. Right. It's going to have to be rethought. And that's where I go, well, maybe there's something to be said for, you know, private ownership mm -hmm. where, you know, there is an accountable board of directors with a mission and customers are customers. And it's not to say they don't have input. Sure. Um, but you look at what, you know, the governance of an ISO New England or a uh, PJM in particular. Uh, and, you know, if you're an asset owner um, or a major load serving entity, mm -hmm. I think you got to say, I don't know how this system really works for me when I'm sharing my influence across over a thousand members, some of which have a very sort of passing interest mm -hmm. in the ISO. In the outcome. If I were to give you the magic wand and say, Vince, you've got three things that you would do now to try and address the issues that you think are hobbling RTOs, what would those three be? Yeah, and, and, and that's, if I knew what the next version of RTOs was, I think I'd be more helpful here. And I'll be the first to admit, it's, it's much easier being a critic than it is a poet. But at the same time, uh, it's a diagnostic exercise. Mm -hmm. And number one would be, we have to have an honest fact-based discussion and we can't be theological either about economics mm -hmm. or about the environment or about engineering. Uh, we have to have a, a balanced understanding of the various policy objectives that we have to deliver on mm -hmm. if we're running a grid of the future. Yeah. So that means shining a light on issues and having an honest discussion. So that, that's step one. Okay. Step two would be, okay, we have based sort of the, 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 the lodestone, the font of these uh, ISOs has been their um, locational margin price markets. Yes. What do we need to do 
in light of what we're seeing happen, mm -hmm. uh, and by that I kind of mean you know, the state interventions, uh, right. the, the, the move to uh, put uh, enhanced uh, renewable penetration, um, to, to build transmission, to facilitate that, things that really transform assumptions mm -hmm. that were underpinning the market and the interface between the market and the operations at the ISO when it was established. Right. So examining that question and figuring out how we're going to pay for things that I think, um, you know, and I would put a lot of things on the table. And I know this is an example that, that gets the fur up on every economist's uh, neck, and, but I would examine single clearing prices for reliability services. Mm -hmm. Um, I, and, and, you know, I, I find what's going on in ERCOT right now very interesting because they've been forced to sort of pull everything apart and look at it. Um, you know, I won't opine as to whether they're going to get to the right solution or not, but I am encouraged by seeing some of the ideas that are coming sure. out. And there's a lot of very interesting things being discussed and, along these lines um, down in Texas about different ways we're going to ensure reliability and the most efficient ways to pay for it. And they may be ways that are, you know, much more administrative than even, you know, ISO capacity sure. markets or much more bilateral and, uh, but still competitive. And I think there's ways to ensure that competition without automatically defaulting to an auction based market mm -hmm. for every service that the ISO needs to procure. Um, and then the third, and really the third probably should be number two and, and, and kind of the redesign should be number three, but number two has to be governance. Mm -hmm. Number two has to be, how do, we, how do we come up with an organization that is sufficiently robust and strong enough to, to say, this is what needs to get done yeah. and to build that consensus and leadership and the mandate that the ISOs currently have, which was very dependent implicitly on kind of what I would call a uh, the regulatory tail we yeah. had back 20 years ago coming out of FERC in, in Washington generally, that's gone. That tailwind has, has completely uh, ceased to blow. I don't think these organizations, when they look at their own internal governance mandates, be their operating agreements, their charters, mm -hmm. or not, they're sufficiently strong enough. I'll put the state, single state ISOs in a different place on that right. point, but I think the multi-state, the ones that take advantage of regionalism, mm -hmm. um, they're not strong enough, in my opinion, to kind of force the changes that need to be done if we have people prepared to accept, you know, we have to make trade-offs and sure. it has to be a fact-based approach to these solutions. Right. And that's maybe one of the things that doesn't get talked about much. Uh, I'll concede our focus is often on what are the market reforms? What is yeah. what, are, what are the mechanics to make sure that we are compensated sufficiently to remain around to do the things that we do, provide reliability and sufficient uh, power when it's needed. But that governance question sometimes gets moved to the background and I think you're trying to move it to the foreground because it's fundamentally, if you don't get that right, it doesn't matter what the rest of this that, is. That's where I'm coming from. Yeah. And I, I understand the temptation because, oh, that's a huge problem. If you go back to an expression you use, can we nibble around the edges yeah. and avoid sort of, uh, to me, I liken it to building a house. And when our house was supposed to house, you know, two kids, the dog, yeah. uh, you know, we had the three bedrooms, the living room, we had a foundation to support that. Mm -hmm. That foundation is still what it was 20 years ago, but the infrastructure on top of that and what it's supposed to accomplish Change. is so different yeah. that I think, you know, we're not sitting uh, on a very sound foundation to accomplish the types of objectives and to solve the types of problems mm -hmm. that the ISOs are currently faced. Right. The good news is I don't think I heard you say get out a bulldozer, but I did think <laughs> you were suggesting that there there's need for some dramatic renovations in order to get it right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, we are certainly appreciative of your time. So in an in, in homage to David Faraday, I've got a few rapid fire questions for you, Vince. These are yes, no questions designed to kind of get your gut reaction off of a couple of things. Uh, and then we'll um, bring this to a close. So if you're ready, uh, I will fire away and say, are you still a supporter of markets? Yes. 
do do markets deliver value that justifies working hard to get them right, or is it just another way to approach it? Uh, I think markets are a way to uh, deliver competitive outcomes. I think there's a range of them. I'd like to see markets uh, work as far as they can. I know this is not a yes no answer. So <laughs> it wasn't a yes no question. I think I might include that one. Question. But I do think we have to have an honest assessment of when markets, what markets are, are good at doing and a recognition. This is go back to the theology thing. Yeah. Let's not be theological that everything has to be resolved through an elaborately designed and constructed market. Because let's face it, these markets are not organic. They don't arise naturally. They are designed. There's a lot of rules. Mm -hmm. They're administered. They're regulated. So if we're going to do all that, I think getting an honest assessment right off the bat, is this the kind of thing that all that infrastructure and cost is worth it? Or is it sort of a problem of a different nature where we can get an 80% solution mm -hmm. without all the trappings that come from single clearing price auctions and rules around offers and bids and market sure. power mitigation, et cetera, and everything that goes with it. So I do think there are limits, but Basically, I, look, I'm not going to say we go back to sure. cost of service based regulation. Great. Are subsidies the death of markets? Subsidies are killing markets. Subsidies don't work easily with markets. Um, and where they, they have to come in, you know, I, I think addressing a, a negative externality through a price is a much better approach than trying to reward people. Um, who are doing, uh, delivering the positive externality. I mean, uh, the disruption, I think, that we've seen is pretty self-evident. I, I get it. I understand why we're doing it that way. But we need, again, an honest understanding that mm -hmm. it, it, it isn't helpful. And markets will have to adapt, for sure. But in doing that adaptation, they're going to lose some of their efficiencies. Right. Have states exceeded the limit of what markets can absorb by pushing ahead on renewables and in-state generation demands? Um, I, I'm of that opinion that we're there. Is FERC helping or hurting the energy transition markets and market participants? Um, I think FERC is an important voice in this. Indeed. For sure. And I, I, I do think, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to do the right thing. Um, I, Again, think there is a lack of, of honest dis debate about, and you're seeing it with the split in the commission. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's a, a contingency that says we signed up for competitive markets to deliver least cost reliable solutions, mm -hmm. and there's a side that says yes, but now we also have to add clean resources to the equation, and those. Uh, perspectives need to come together, understanding that there will be some compromise to both mm -hmm. uh, in order to preserve both. And if we're not prepared to, if FERC doesn't want wholesale competitive electricity markets done by ISOs anymore, they need to come right out and say that. Ironically, they're saying, oh, this is exactly what we want. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the actions don't always align with the stated objective. Yeah. Vince, is there anything else you want to share before we wrap up? We certainly appreciate your time and your very well thought out comments about how we try and address what are very difficult issues. If they were easy to solve, we wouldn't be having this conversation. It'd already be fixed. Um, Terry Boston, my former boss, uh, used to say, and it would it'd start off like this. I would go, Terry, this is too complicated. The design of this product, um, you know, it's, I can't begin to follow it. My job is to try and disaggregate all this complexity, engineering complexity, environmental issues, the economic issues, operational questions, put it into a document that FERC and other policymakers can understand. Can, everybody can understand. This is, we're just getting so opaque and difficult to understand as we layer on one exception to an exception to exception. And as you say, so the act around the fringes. Mm -hmm. And his response was, Vince, and I can't do his accent, so I'll <laughs> stop it. But he said, Vince, you know, the business of, of generating and delivering electricity isn't rocket science. It's much more complicated. <laughs> and that was the he's kind not of wrong. aphorism that Terry was known for. And yeah. he's not wrong. And so 
what this means, this problem, and I, I guess I'll admit to being biased because I come at it from the inside, but this is the type of problem that we all need to respect expertise on. Mm -hmm. I know that's not fashionable these days in, in any quarters, but I think we need to empower expertise. And when the ISOs truly were independent organizations, which meant that their professional judgment was being respected mm -hmm. by their regulator, and they would carry an implicit presumption that if the ISO said it needed to be done, it was going to get done. Right. My final point is we'll have to get back to a place where we respect the expertise uh, necessary to address these complicated problems. And I love populism and I love empowerment and I, I love the fact that we have democracy sure. and we have a voice. But at the end of the day, these problems, I think, are going to get resolved by trusting in, I don't want to say trust the science because that's an overused expression sure. these days, but that's the kind of thinking that I think if I had a magic wand, we would get back into that kind of an environment. Great. Well, thank you, Vince. We certainly appreciate your attention to the issues. We always appreciate the good conversation uh, here at EPSA. And yeah, that's, look, no question, you guys at EPSA have been, I think, very thoughtful. And I appreciate your patience and listening to things that you don't like uh, all the time. And um, as I said, you know, earlier, I don't like it always either, <laughs> but uh, just because it's not a popular message doesn't mean uh, that I don't think we should put it on the table, kick it around a little right. bit and see what falls out from it. Great. Thanks, Vince. There's no shortage of thorny questions facing the future of America's grid. But as Vince said, it's important to start with the facts, have an honest conversation, and sometimes see where the trade-offs have to be made. We're optimistic that RTOs and competitive markets can still deliver the energy future all Americans want to see. Stay tuned for more conversation about what's needed to make sure we get there. You can find more information about the latest progress from competitive power suppliers and what policies can help achieve the best outcomes at our website at www.epsa.org. Thanks for listening to Energy Solutions. If you like this episode, please share it on social media or with your coworkers, friends, and family. You can also connect with us on Twitter at EPSA News and on LinkedIn. And subscribe, follow, leave a rating or comment on Spotify, Pandora, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Energy Solutions is brought to you by the Electric Power Supply Association. EPSA represents America's competitive power suppliers, which bring about 150,000 megawatts of power generation resources to customers throughout the United States. Discover the power of competition at www.epsa.org.